your particular interest about the illicit drugs, uh, when it came? My particular interest about the illicit drugs came when, uh, mainly in the mid-1980s. Uh, in the mid-1980s, uh, the United States were experiencing a crack problem. I put that in quotes because we thought we were experiencing a crack problem. Just like you now think that you're experiencing a crack problem. You're not. But I was fooled into believing that we were experiencing a crack problem, and so I wanted to offer whatever expertise I could to help solve the crack problem, to solve crack addiction. Um, that's what, that was my main sort of introduction in the late 1980s. In the beginning of the 90s, I started to work in a prison here in Sao Paulo. It's a very large prison, 7,000 inmates or more. And when I arrived there in 1989, cocaine by injection was the fashion in, in, the, in the prison. So we had very high prevalence of HIV and hepatitis C. We harvested blood of uh, 1492 prisoners there. And we found that 17.3% were HIV positive and 60% were hepatitis C virus positive. And uh, then in 1992, crack invaded the prison. And so, the, and, and cocaine by injection disappeared completely, completely. We never found uh, a syringe or a needle anymore in the prison. Can you explain this phenomenon? It's kind of simple. I don't like needles, and if I can get the same effect by smoking it, I'm going to smoke. Um, I'm afraid of needles, and, and I think a number of people are less likely to inject. So I think that's the major thing. If you're going to get the same effect, same onset, I would advise people to smoke. And there was two conse consequences. First, when the, the, the prevalence of HIV fall down. In three years, it came down to eight, around 8%, three or four years. But the number of uh, crack uh, users increased incredibly. Yeah. I mean, with injecting, you have to have more of a specialty equipment, right? With smoking, you can make anything into a pipe, and so it's just convenience. That's. Uh, yeah, if I'm in prison and I have access to the drug, give me the crack. Uh, I, it makes sense. Uh, you're in prison. I get it. How do you s separate the drug addiction from drug use? Yeah, how do you separate drug addiction from drug use? Let's make it really simple. The last three presidents of the United States all were drug users. None were drug addicts. They have contributed to the U.S. society in important ways. Um, so the majority of drug users look like them. And we have, in medicine, sets of criteria. International Classification of Disorders has sets of criteria by which we decide whether someone is addicted, whether based on the number of symptoms that they meet, the DSM-5 uh, in the US. So you have these clear symptoms and characteristic or, 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 or criteria by which you judge people. So it's not, uh, when we think of addiction, we don't think of it, uh, drug addiction, we don't think of it in the popular way that people think of shopping addiction or internet addiction. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about these symptoms, and symptoms such as um, using more than you intended to use for longer periods of time. I'm talking about several unsuccessful attempts to cut down or stop your drug use. Using the drug uh, in situations repeatedly that is uh, physically uh, potentially harmful or psychologically potentially harmful to you and you know it. Uh, maybe there's a withdrawal syndrome. Maybe there's tolerance. Um, so a list of criteria we have that 
the person has to meet before they are considered being addiction addicted. They have considerable psychosocial disruptions. Carl, talk about your experiences with the animals in your lab. Uh, so I started out studying laboratory animals, rats and little primate work. Um, uh, studying the rats, uh, I was starting out mainly looking at dopamine uh, in this area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. People talk about this as being the reward center. And I was watching uh, dopamine levels go up and down in response to cocaine and nicotine and those sorts of things. And I thought I knew something about addiction based on the levels of dopamine, um, but I didn't. And so I started to learn about behavior. And so I started studying the animal's behavior, and I started reading the literature on behavior. One of the things that was most striking about behavior and the animals were uh, the finding that they would take drugs until they died if you allowed an animal to press a lever to receive intravenous ejections of cocaine or methamphetamine, they would do so until they died. I was struck by that, those findings. But when I looked at those findings more carefully, um, I noticed that the animals were in an isolated cage. They had nothing to do but to press the lever. And of course, if you have nothing to do, you'll press the lever, and they did. But when you provide it, alternatives or you enrich the cage with uh, a sexually receptive mate, a running wheel, or sweet treats, banana chips for primates, they wouldn't take the drugs until they died. In fact, they would, take, they would engage in these other behaviors more often. So again, that reinforced for me the importance of the environment, the importance of providing alternatives to people in a variety of settings. Um, so the, the animal experience, my work with the animals, has helped me to think about human experiments on the one hand, and it, it also has helped me to evaluate other data that have been collected in the animal laboratory because sometimes there are scientific reports or newspapers report scientific findings uh, that may have been collected in an animal and they say addiction, uh, we found the brain chemicals responsible for addiction and they're talking about a study that was uh, conducted in an, a rat in an isolated environment. That's not very, that doesn't model the human condition very well. And, and the experiences of uh, with uh, human beings uh, Exchanging money for drugs. Yeah, so that that, that experience uh, it grew out of the animal work. Um, after seeing that animals would choose to take alternatives, the other option, if they're attractive, we thought it would be cool if we uh, provided crack addicts with alternatives. Provide them with alternatives like a $5 choice or taking a hit of crack. Um, when you do that, they will take $5 on about half of the occasion and the drug on the other half of the occasion. But when you don't provide any option, they'll take crack on all of the occasions. But we extended those findings uh, uh, by increasing the amount of money to a drug like methamphetamine, which in the United States today, we think it's our worst drug. So when we provide it, money uh, amounts as high as $20 and we offered them a hit of methamphetamine or the $20, they never took the methamphetamine. They always took the money. So it just goes to show that if the alternatives are attractive enough, you can change the behavior. And if you were choosing as the Xaron drugs in the United States, what would be the measures you take to if I was I'm sorry the czar of the drugs oh drug czar hmm. if I was the drug czar what were the measures that I would be taking um, the first measure I would look at 
would be the number of people in my prisons for drug-related offenses. So drug-related offenses is the number one reason people are arrested in the United States. In Brazil, too. In Brazil, too. And I would be embarrassed if I was the drug czar because I know that that's not the crime that I'm really worried about in the society. If I want to keep my society safe, there are other crimes that I want to make sure my jails are, uh, the, the prisoners are there for. So that's number one, um, uh, the number of folks in, in, in jail for a drug-related offense. Um, two, I would want to know what does my drug education campaign look like? How am I educating the public about this activity? What am I doing? Am I providing scare tactics only, or am I providing real information? That would be number two. Number three, I would, be, I would want to make sure that, this, again, safety is always number one. I want to make sure that people, even though the drugs may be le illegal, I want to make sure that I understand what street drugs are are cut with? What are the adulterants in the street drugs? So when we confiscate drugs, I would make sure that we analyzed those drugs and reported the analysis to each lo local community that the drugs were confiscated from. So the local community would know what drugs to avoid, be not so much because of the drug itself, but because of these adulterants, we know they are worse than the drug in many of the cases. So those would be my three real priorities. Do you have two children? Yeah, three, actually. Three. I have two that I raised, yeah. yeah. And uh, you, how do you talk about drugs with them? Yeah, so my kids, the two that I raised, uh, so for the audience who probably don't know, um, so my job uh, has been to study drugs, and that means I give drugs to people, and I study them. I give drugs like crack cocaine, marijuana, methamphetamine, and I study the effects. So my children, ever since they were able to walk, I work around the clock. I'm always working. So one of the ways I spend time with my children is that I take them to work. So since they've been very little, they have seen me go give someone crack cocaine and, and study them. They've seen me give people marijuana and we have had our conversations about drugs in that context. But, so it's not special, it's just what dad does. It's, it's not special. Um, so I don't say, sons, we have to have a drug talk. That's not what we do. Um, what I say, what I really emphasize to my kids is that your parents expect you to do well in society. They expect you to be a voice for the poor, for the people who are voiceless, and that means that you have to be well-educated. That means that you have to do well in your studies. That's what we emphasize. If anything interferes with that, then they have a problem with their parents. But if nothing interferes with that, they don't have a problem with their parents. And so if they're driving their automobile too fast, and that disrupts their ability to do well at university, they have a problem with me. If they uh, have an unprotected sex and they may uh, get someone pregnant and that might uh, potentially uh, disrupt their education, they have a problem with me. If they use drugs in a way that um, uh, they are not doing well in school, they have a problem with me. But as long as None of those, as long as they are doing well in school and handling their responsibility, they have no problem with me.